In today's video, we're going to talk about a brand new single board computer, the Vim4 from Cardass. We'll talk about the unit itself, the specs, the price. We'll talk about how it stacks up against the Raspberry Pi 4. And at the end of the video, I'm going to do a complete tutorial on how to install Ubuntu on the Vim4 and how to configure the unit as a mobile companion for your tablet like the iPad Pro or the Samsung S8 Galaxy Tab. So let's just dive straight into the spec. This is an eight core ARM single board computer. Four of those cores are running at 2.2 gigahertz and the other four are running at two gigahertz. Contrast this with the Pi 4, which is just four cores, all of which run at 1.5 gigahertz. Although I will say I have overclocked my Pi to 1.8 gigahertz with absolutely no problems whatsoever. The Vim 4 comes with eight gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of embedded eMMC storage. Contrast this with the Pi where there is an eight gigabyte RAM option but there's no embedded storage. You have to add an SD card of your own. For connectivity, the Vim 4 has a 10 gigabit Ethernet port and it has a Wi-Fi 6 adapter. That Wi-Fi 6 adapter actually presents as two separate adapters in the operating system, and that comes in quite handy for our mobile configuration, as we'll see later. The Pi 4 only has a single Wi-Fi chip, and it only has a 1 gigabit Ethernet port. For display output, the Vim 4 has a single full-size HDMI output, Contrast this with the Pi 4, which has two HDMI outputs, but they are micro HDMI ports, which I find quite frustrating. Weirdly, the Vim 4 has an HDMI in. I haven't really seen many use cases for this yet, and I couldn't get it to work inside Ubuntu. I did see that Christopher Barnard over at Explaining Computers got it to show up in Android, but I haven't made any progress with that whatsoever. Turning to USB connectivity, the Vim 4 has a single USB 2 USB-C connector, not USB 3 over USB-C. It also has a single USB 2 over USB-A and a USB 3 over USB-A. That's probably for me the only disappointing part of this unit. If you contrast this with the Pi, which has two USB 3 USB-A ports, two USB 2 USB-A ports and a USB-C port as well. And one other thing I'd like to know about the Vim 4, it has an M.2 slot on the back, so you can put an M.2 SSD drive in there if you so choose. So comparing it on specs alone, this is definitely a more powerful unit than the Pi 4. You do pay for that though. The unit I got comes complete with the active cooling kit. So this really nice heat sink and fan. And that goes for about 200 pounds in the UK and I think $240 in the US. Without the cooling kit, it's about 180 pounds in the UK and about $220 in the US. Obviously those prices will vary given the crazy chip shortage we've got right now. The thing that matters most though is performance. How does this stack up when you compare it against the Pi? I did a bunch of network tests, a bunch of disk tests, a bunch of CPU tests. Let me just kind of run you through the results. Looking at network performance, I wasn't really able to test the Vim4 properly given my network setup at home. So I don't have a 10 gigabit ethernet switch. So I was only able to measure both devices on a one gigabit ethernet switch, but they both did hit close to theoretical max, about 950 megabits per second. I have no doubt that the Vim4 will work on 10 gigabit ethernet. I just can't test it. On Wi-Fi, I measured both devices at 95 megabits per second, give or take, but I live in a residential area. The Wi-Fi around here is terrible. So don't take that result as being any kind of indication of how good the performance is. I do think this is relevant though, because most of you are probably operating under the same constraints. You probably live where there's Wi-Fi congestion and you probably don't have 10 gigabit ethernet at home. So you're not gonna get a massive improvement in performance from the Vim 4, but also remember there is that second Wi-Fi chip and that does come in handy and we will see that very soon. Turning our attention to storage speeds though, comparing the internal storage of the Vim 4 to the SD storage that you get on a Raspberry Pi 4, the Vim 4 is miles ahead. Using the best SD card I've managed to find for the Pi 4, I'm able to get about eight and a half millibits per second read and maybe five and a half millibits per second write. The Vim 4 though gives me 21 millibits per second read and about 50 millibits per second write. So significantly faster on the internal storage that's in the Vim 4 over SD storage that comes on the Pi. What matters to me most though is how fast are the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis when running on both devices. So I tested starting up Emacs, which is something I do all the time. It's one of my favorite programs. See my video here for more on that. This starts up in about four and a half seconds, five seconds sometimes on the Pi 4 and started in just under three and a half seconds on the Vim 4. So the other thing I tested was a complete build of my website. And this is where I saw some noticeable performance improvements. This takes about seven and a half to eight seconds on a regular basis on the Pi 4. And 
maxed out at like 5.2 seconds on the vim 4 and sometimes was as close to four and a half seconds so a really noticeable improvement in performance if you've seen any of my other raspberry pi videos you'll know that i like to carry the pi as a companion device with my ipad pro to give me kind of like a mobile linux workstation that i can carry with me and use from the pi and that's what i'm most interested in when looking at the vim 4 and i do think the vim 4 is an excellent device for this use case primarily because it has inbuilt storage it has dual Wi-Fi chips, which makes for a really nice connectivity solution. And it has a, a built-in mini operating system called UWOW that makes it really easy to install a fully fledged operating system like Ubuntu or Android. And that's what we're going to see right now. Quick point here, the Vim 4 requires between 9 and 12 volts, whereas the Pi 4 requires only 5 volts. You can safely power the Pi 4 from the USB-C port on an iPad Pro. You cannot power the Vim 4 from the iPad Pro. It doesn't work. It does power quite nicely from a battery, so you can still take it with you on the road. Obviously, you can power it from a, a socket or whatever. That's absolutely fine. If you're in the train or on the plane, you've got, you got a charger. That's great. But if you want a truly mobile solution with the Vim 4, you will need a battery. So you'll need to power your Vim 4 using a USB-C cable. I also recommend that you plug in an Ethernet cable as well. It's just the easiest way. You'll probably find there's an Ethernet port on the back of your wireless router. You need to boot the unit into UWOW. If your unit is brand new, that's what it'll do by default. If you've already installed an operating system or you're having issues getting into UWOW, then hold down the function button, which is the middle button, and quick press reset, which is the button closest to the USB port, and then release the function button. The whole unit reboots and eventually starts UWOW. Now, you can plug a monitor and a keyboard in at this point if you want and do the whole setup that way, but it's also possible to access the UWOW control panel from the browser using a little hotspot setup, and that's what I want to do because I think that's just the easiest option if you haven't got a monitor or you haven't got a keyboard. So let's do that. So to toggle on the hotspot, just press the function button once, and then in your Wi-Fi on your computer, you'll see a network called vim4-something. That something is the last few digits of your serial number. Select that Wi-Fi network, and the default password is 12345678. And you'll see on screen here, I've got the documentation. One of the things that I really liked about the Vim4 experience, the documentation is absolutely excellent, and I will link it in the description below. Before we can proceed, we actually need to allow our connection inside the UO operating system. And to do that, just quick tap the power button, which is the button closest to the GPIO pins or the button furthest away from the USB port. You'll see it's a successful connection when the white light just starts flashing slowly. So once you're connected, you can click on HTTP colon slash UWOW like this and come to the control center here. This is essentially what you would see on your screen. Now, if you had a monitor plugged in, use the keyboard to navigate or you can even click. I'm just going to press enter on wizard, press enter to continue and I'm going to refresh the images list just to make sure I've got the latest operating system images. And I want to come down here to number five for me, which is Ubuntu 2204 with GNOME. So that's Ubuntu with the desktop environment. You don't have to install the desktop environment if you don't want. I'm going to do that because it's the easiest way to get a fully working remote desktop. Press enter and then enter again to download the image. Once it downloads, press install. After installation, just press enter to reboot the unit. And now... UWOW won't start now. The unit's going to boot into Ubuntu. And you can, again, plug in a monitor and a keyboard at this point if you want. But we're going to access the unit remotely and continue the setup from there. So now we're going to connect to the Ubuntu operating system that's running on the Vim 4 over SSH for the next few setup steps. I'm doing this from Kitty Terminal on Mac OS, but any terminal is fine. So we're going to start by SSH. The username is Cardas, like that. And then at cardas.local, which is the host name you'll be prompted to say yes to the key. That's the right key. And then the password is also Cardas, and we are in. So the first thing I like to do is just run sudo apt update to get the latest packages. And then sudo apt upgrade to install the latest packages. Okay, so we're completely up to date. So I'll just clear the screen with control L and now we're going to install a VNC server so we can set up a remote desktop. So we're gonna do sudo apt install tiger VNC standalone server like that when prompted press yes cool control l to clear the screen again and we need to set a password for vnc so we'll do vnc password like that and i'm going to set pass one two pass one two don't want to view only password so no next up using your text editor of choice we need to edit the tiger vnc vnc server.users file and what you want to do here is add 
colon two equals Cardas. So Cardas here is the name of the user that we're going to allow to access this remote desktop. Let's save this to disk. Okay. And now we need to start the VNC server. So control L to clear again and sudo system CTL start tiger VNC server at colon two, colon two being the user that we set up in the file a second ago. Yeah, that's great. And if you want the VNC server to start every time you reboot, it's also useful to enable that service for auto start like that. Brilliant. So by default, the VNC connection is only accessible on the local host, which means that a machine like my Mac or my iPad can't connect to it. To do that, we're going to use an SSH tunnel. And I've shown this a few times on the iPad and a link to a video above that has that. But I want to show how it works on a Mac or a Windows or a Linux machine. So we're going to run SSH-L. And the port is 5902. The two correspond to the colon two that we set in the user's file. Colon, localhost. So localhost in this case refers to the machine that we're tunneling to. So I want to be able to access port 5902 on the local host of the CADAS machine on 5902 locally on the Mac, and then just as normal CADAS at CADAS.local. Now we can open up the VNC connection. So on Mac, you can run the screen sharing software and you can type in localhost 5902, type in your password for VNC, which is pass12 that I set. And there we go. We have a working vnc connection to our vim4 which is great with vnc working the next thing to do is to set up the hotspot on the vim4 so we can connect directly from the ipad or the mac directly to the vim4 itself to do this we're going to come back into our ssh and then in ssh we're going to run sudo nmcli dev wi-fi hotspot if name wlan1 to pick up the second wireless adapter we're going to use wlan0 as the adapter we connect to the internet it's a band BG for the BG Wi-Fi band, let's say SSID, we're going to call it VimPad. You can set up whatever network name you want and then password, just do VimPad123. That has to be at least eight characters to work and then just press enter. And that creates a hotspot. And now we can connect to that hotspot from our Mac. So I'm just going to disconnect from SSH for a second and then come into my Wi-Fi up here, come to other networks. You'll see VimPad here. And when prompted, put in your password, I've already done that. And now I'll just set up my SSH tunnel again with the command that we ran before. And I'm going to connect back to my screen sharing system. Awesome. If you want that hotspot to start automatically when the Vim4 boots, then come back to SSH and run sudo nmcli con modify hotspot with a capital H connection dot auto connect true. Type in your password if you need to. And next time you start, the hotspot auto starts on WLAN 1. So you can always connect after powering on the Vim 4. So back in the screen sharing, there are a few more things we need to do before we finish this off. So the first thing is if you come up into the little icon in the top corner here and press on the network, you'll see that all of the network options are grayed out. And that means you can't connect the Vim 4 to the internet or to any other Wi-Fi over uh, the VNC connection. And to fix this, we need to install a policy into Ubuntu that allows this operation over VNC. Then back in SSH, using your favorite text editor, create a file at etc polkit one local authority 50 local.d, like that. And then you can call it, say, wi fi scans.pkla, like that. And then the content is this. I will add this content to the linked page on my website and into the description so that I don't have to read it out, which would be tedious. Save that to disk. Then in, in SSH, if we just do sudo system ctl restart tiger vnc server at colon two to restart the vnc server and then go back into our screen sharing system and come up to the menu now. We can see now that we're able to actually manipulate the network. And now I can connect this Wi-Fi here to my home network. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, great. You can see I'm connected to my home network and I've got the hotspot active. So this means that even though my Mac is connected to the hotspot on the Vim 4, it should now have internet access. So let's test that by opening up the browser. And let's just refresh this page to see what happens. And there we go. And just so you can see, I'll double check Wi-Fi, it is connected to Vimpad. So now we've got 
the Vim4 acting as a hotspot, which is great. We're able to connect to that hotspot from our device, Mac, iPad, tablet, whatever. And we're able to connect the Vim4 to the network of Wi-Fi and provide internet access to our device. This is excellent. There are a few more things you'll want to do though, if you're going to use this setup. So returning to the screen sharing, the first thing you might wanna do is come to applications and try out some of these applications. And the first one I tried out was Firefox web browser. And if you click on it, it sort of spins for a few minutes and then eventually it does nothing. And the way to diagnose problems like this is if you open up applications and come to utilities and go to terminal, I'm just gonna make the font size a little bit bigger. And if you try to run Firefox from here, you'll see that actually it needs this snap installing. So we can run snap install Firefox. Great. Put in your password. Once the snap's installed, you can come back to the applications menu up here and press Firefox web browser and it will now load. There we go. Excellent. Firefox loaded. The final thing you might want to do here is tweak the resolution and the scaling of the VNC session specifically to your device. So I know that my iPad has a certain geometry and I like to set that resolution. And I also like to set the display scaling so that it looks nice on the iPad. Let me show you how to do that. So first of all, we can come into the settings menu up here. Come to, I'm just gonna close this so it's less, less distracting. Come to displays and then choose scale. I like to choose scale of 200. It just makes things a little bit clearer on the screen on the iPad. Let's apply. Keep changes. Now you can see it looks a little bit silly on this resolution and I want to choose a new resolution, but you can't choose the exact resolution here for the iPad. You can only choose from these kind of pre-canned ones. To give the exact resolution for the iPad, we'll do that in the configuration file. So coming back to our SSH, so using your favorite text editor, edit the file .vnc config in your home directory. And I've already edited mine. I've added geometry equals 2388 by 1668. That is the resolution of my iPad. Use the resolution that's correct for your device. Save that. And then restart your VNC server. Reconnect. You might be looking at this and thinking that doesn't look like the right resolution, Rob. And you're right. And it's because within this VNC session, that resolution doesn't work very well. In fact, if you come to the settings, you can see that the resolution is set to 1920 by 1200, but the resolution option is here in the drop down menu now. And if I connect this to my iPad now, and then by the magic of editing, show that instead of this window, you'll see that the resolution does look right on the iPad window, which is fantastic. So there we go, the Vim4 running Ubuntu, accessible over a Wi-Fi hotspot with a complete VNC installation using the second Wi-Fi adapter we can connect to the internet and we can share that internet connection with any connected devices. I think this is a great option to carry with you as a mobile Linux computer if you have a tablet like the iPad Pro. I will certainly be using it in place of the Raspberry Pi for the next few months and I'll report back on how well it works out in the long term. For two reasons, one is, I wanna try a more powerful unit. Second, my Raspberry Pi exploded, if you saw on my community page, and I have to fix that at some point. I hope you found this video useful. I hope you found it entertaining. If so, please hit like, please hit subscribe, and maybe hit the bell as well, so you don't miss out on any future content. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.